Well, if it was a cooking class for catching bass, this spinnerbait would be one of my favorite recipes. Start with one wire metal shaft and add in a jig head molded around a stout hook. Add one ball bearing swivel and sprinkle in two to three metal blades. Garnish with a skirt of your choice and finish off with salt and freshly ground pepper to taste. Having sampled hundreds of lures from almost a hundred years of bass fishing, I consider myself something of a lure connoisseur. But for me, the spinnerbait is the ultimate comfort food. Whenever I get that craving, I tie on a 3 8 ounce double wheel leaf spinnerbait, cast it into the broth, and wait for somebody to take a nibble. Well, today on Retro Bassin, we are paying homage to one of my personal favorite bass fishing lures of all time, as we serve up the long and flavorful history of the spinnerbait. Retro Bassin, kicking some ass in wearing rayon jackets. Thinking about Bill Dance, watching these fish prance through my Ray-Ban glasses. Ain't nothing better than 40-year-old lures coming off of Zepco 33. Out on the bass boat, making beer cans float, doing some trespassing. Fishing it old school, this old stuff rules. Welcome to Retro Bassin. Now before we get started, if this is your first time here at Retro Bassin and you like to fish it old school, talking about classic rods, reels, lures, and equipment from well, fishing days gone past, well stick around, consider subscribing, and be sure to hit that bell icon. Otherwise you won't know we post a new video just like this one. Unlike some other fishing first, such as the Rapala of Floating Minnow, where the modern day version very much resembles that original bait, the spinnerbait has morphed quite a bit over time. As a result, I think the verdict on exactly what qualifies as a spinnerbait has been something of a debate. Outdoor writer, bass fishing after dark host, and velvet jacket connoisseur Ken Duke holds that the Shannon Twin Spinner designed by Wisconsin's Jesse Shannon in 1915, is the first official spinnerbait. Well, I'm not one to challenge the Duke. In my opinion, the Shannon Twin Spin bears very little resemblance to the modern day spinnerbait. Sure, it has blades, swivels, wire arms, a molded head, and even a skirt, but to me, it is all rearranged in a very non-traditional way, almost looks like a musky bait or something that AI would produce if he told it to invent a spinnerbait. Here is a Shannon Twin Spin that I picked up specifically for this episode. I actually snagged two of these online and I'm 100% going to give them a cast. The first thing I noticed is this bait is a lot more bulky than I thought. Seeing pictures online, I thought this would be a subtle spinnerbait but in the hand, it really looks like something you would actually use for musky or pike. I think a lot of that has to do with that horsehair skirt, which is tied very full. While there are no ball bearing or even barrel swivels attached to these two blades, they do have spinning capabilities. Well, I have no doubt the 5A sound Shannon Twin Spin is a fish catcher. I just don't think you would fish it in the way that you would fish a traditional spinnerbait. And it certainly doesn't resemble anything old Hank Parker would be pitching to shallow cover during a Bassmaster Classic. Still, most lore collectors agree if you've got to point to a single first spinnerbait, it is the Shannon Twin Spin. Another early entry into the spinnerbait genre is the casting hell diver from the Hauser Fly Company of St. Louis, Missouri. While I don't have an exact release date on the Helldiver, I did find a very cool advertising matchbook on the bait from 1952. So the Helldiver is likely one of the first ever safety pin style spinner baits. I do have a handful of Helldiver baits in my collection 
And between the matchbook advertising and this amazing box art, whoever was in charge of the marketing for the Hauser Fly Company truly had it dialed in. Let's go ahead and crack this thing open, but first I do want to take a walk around this amazing display box. I can't imagine walking into a tackle shop, perhaps sometime in the late 1940s, early 1950s, and seeing this thing on the shelf. What a great, great looking box. On the front it says uh, it is the casting hell diver, I guess as opposed to the trolling hell diver. The Superior Underwater Bait, and it's even got a price on here, $1.25. What's interesting is there's no actual mention of spinner bait yet. On the back of the box, it does have a description of the Helldiver bait, and I did notice something very interesting in this description, which I will read to you. Uh, it says, this Superior Underwater Weedless Casting Bait casts like a bullet and has a pronounced action all its own. Thanks to the spinning action of the spoon on top of the hook. In other words, this spinnerbait is so early, they're still referring to the spinnerbait blade as a spoon. Here is a hell diver out of the box, and we are definitely looking a whole lot more like a traditional spinnerbait. First off, it does have a nice will leaf style blade to a barrel swivel, not yet the ball bearing swivel but still, I'm sure you get some great spinning action there. Next, we do have a true safety pin style wire. Still doesn't go to the hook, and this is kind of one of those issues I think early spinnerbaits had. They couldn't quite figure out how to fuse that hook to the safety pin wire. And here, we just kind of wrapped it around the head of the bait. The Helldiver does have an interesting weed guard, kind of a... Uh, Maybe unnecessary, I'm not sure, especially when you look at the size of this teeny hook. Lastly, it does go to a skirt, and this is more of a vinyl skirt. Looks a lot more like a traditional spinnerbait. I guarantee this thing probably doesn't swim quite like a Hank Parker classic. <laughs> In 1959, Bill Humphreys started a wholesale sporting goods business traveling across Louisiana, Mississippi, and Texas in a secondhand bread truck pitching his H&H &H lures. An early standout for Humphreys was the H&H &H Spinner, a compact 3 8 ounce safety pin style spinner bait with one to two blades and a latex skirt. The most interesting thing about the H&H &H Spinner is that it came with a single unattached double hook. And when I caught up with Bill Humphreys at this year's ICAST in Orlando, Florida, he shared with me that more than one angler over the years has gone fishing with a hookless H&H &H only to realize their mistake after a few quote unquote missed fish. Here is an H&H &H that I picked up out of my spinnerbait box, and you can just see the total subtlety and simplicity of this neat little spinner. There is no telling how many millions of fish have been caught on the H&H &H over the years, but we'll take a quick walk around this micro spinnerbait. The first thing you notice about the H&H, &H, we'll start with the blade, is it does have a nice H&H &H stamped little Colorado blade. I'm not sure the size of that blade, but this is pretty much the standard blade that you get on most H&Hs. It is a nice, small, hammered blade, and it's attached to a barrel swivel. Next, we see a nice safety pin style arm, a short safety pin style arm that enters into a molded jig head. I really wish I would have asked Humphreys about this at ICAST, but I've always wondered why that wire enters the top of that jig head as opposed to the nose like pretty much every other spinnerbait you see. There is a great little latex tube skirt here, and there's probably a pretty good chance that this particular tube skirt was made in Shreveport, Louisiana by my friend Michael Bacon back in the day. On the underside of the bait, there is a little bit of a ring there onto which you attach this double hook. And that double hook actually is removable which is pretty interesting. But you could totally imagine getting this thing out of the box, making some tasty casts, getting a bite or two, and wondering why the heck 
you can't hook a fish. Another contributor to spinnerbait history is Chuck Wood, a Kansas City, Missouri tackle shop owner who in 1963 developed the Wood Beetle, aka the Beetle Spin. I'm still unsure exactly how the Beetle Spin got its name because to me the body of the lure much more resembles a caterpillar or a grub than a beetle. However, I did read somewhere that the Beetle Spin's blade was called a beetle spin because it resembles the small shell of a beetle. Wood pitched his idea to Virgil Ward's Bass Buster Lure Company. However, Ward initially did not bite on the idea, worrying that the beetle spin was not going to be a big water bait. Well, a successful big water fishing trip between the two men changed all of that, and the beetle spin went on to become Bass Buster's number one selling lure. Here is a beetle spin that I snagged from Whalen's Tackle Box in perhaps my favorite beetle spin color of all time, that green caterpillar. The beetle spin is by far the most finesse bait on this list, and I can understand how Virgil Ward was initially concerned that this would only be a small water, probably pond bait. So first off, looking at the bait, it does have a nice Colorado leaf blade. And yeah, you know what? That kind of does resemble the shell of a beetle. It goes to a barrel swivel. We are not quite in the ball bearing swivel era yet. And it goes to this nice safety pin style arm. One unique thing about the beetle spin, and I've always liked this, is the fact that this safety pin style arm can actually be opened up so that you can change not just the soft plastic beetle on it, but also the jig head. Like many anglers, the beetle spin was one of the first lures I cast as a kid, but to be honest, it took me until adulthood to truly learn the secret sauce of fishing this micro spinnerbait. I think I had to become a much better spinnerbait fisherman in general until I learned how to properly fish the beetle spin. But in the meantime, this is still a favorite among my two little bass and buds, so I better make sure I put this beetle spin back where it belongs. While guiding on Arkansas's Lake Catherine in the late 1940s, a young man with hair so blonde they nicknamed him Cotton came to rely on a bait known as the Upperman Bucktail Jig. Well, when a young Cotton could not afford to buy them, he actually decided to make his own and thus started the Cotton Cordell Lure Company. The first lure designed by Cotton Cordell was called the Banana Head, a bucktail jig tied with dog hair in place of harder to find deer hair. For his next lure, Cordell built upon the design of that banana head jig and made the Washita Spinner. Well, my friend Michael Bacon of Bacon's Tackle in Shreveport, Louisiana, is actually a former business associate and roommate of Cotton Cordell. And he recalls when Cotton Cordell was making and selling the Washita Spinners, actually using real safety pins to craft the lures. I don't currently have any wash stall spinners in my collection. They're actually pretty hard to find, like a lot of vintage spinnerbaits, but I do have this later version of a spinnerbait from Cotton Cordell. This is a safety pin style spinnerbait, probably from the 1970s. And what's interesting about this era of spinnerbait is they're really starting to tweak exactly what goes into a spinnerbait. First off, you can see that the blade itself is much more pronounced. It's actually even stamped with the Cotton Cordell name on it. And that is almost more of an Indiana blade, I would say. It does go to a uh, barrel swivel. We're still not in the ball bearing swivel era yet. And that is attached to a safety pin. Now, what's interesting is look at how long that arm is. That is definitely very different from some of those early H&H &H and beetle spin baits that we saw. It does go to a molded jig head, a silicone skirt, and probably about the <laughs> tiniest spinnerbait hook you will ever see. While better known for his plastic productions, there is no doubt that the Washita spinner firmly cast Cotton Cordell 
into spinnerbait history. Before we get on to the next chapter of spinnerbait history, I do want to pause and remind everybody to head on over to RetroBassinTackle.com. We are freshly stocked with shirts, hats, decals, logo lures, and more. And now, especially with the holidays coming up, the Bass and Bud Starter Kit is a great option for that angler in your life. So head on over to RetroBassinTackle.com. I pretty much box up every order myself, so if there's something specific you're looking for, drop me a note and I'll see you over there. Ah, oh, the Bass Master Classic. That famous tournament that can turn anglers into icons and can also transform ordinary fishing lures into national phenomena. Early on, the spinnerbait absolutely dominated Bass Fishing Super Bowl, and in 1971, at the first ever Bass Master Classic, Bobby Murray took home the trophy, casting a quarter ounce Stan Sloan aggravated spinnerbait, just like this one. The next year, at the 1972 Bass Master Classic on Percy Priest Reservoir outside of Nashville, Tennessee, Don Butler took home the trophy, casting one of these. A small oaky bug spinnerbait of his own making out of his tackle shop in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I have actually done a pretty good bit of fishing with the small oaky bug, and it is probably one of my favorite old school spinnerbaits to fish. They really did dial in the design at this point. I feel like the hook size is passable, the skirt length is perfect, I do love that molded head. The wire is just the right length, and of course, we do have finally, finally, a ball bearing swivel. Rayo Breckenridge won the third annual Bassmaster Classic in 1973 on what most people believe was a spinnerbait. But the next three years were absolutely lights out for the spinnerbait, in particular, the Fleck Weed Wader spinnerbait. In 1974, 1975, and 1976, all those tournaments were won on Flex Weed Wader Spinnerbait, which understandably made the Weed Wader one of the hottest baits on the market in the 1970s. In fact, in a 2020 article on this very subject, Ken Duke calculated that 19 of 49 Bassmasters at the time were won using a spinnerbait. Obviously, spinnerbaits weren't the only bait that caught fish during those classics, but looking at those numbers, spinnerbaits heavily contributed to about 39% of classic victories during that period. Truly set your mind spinning. Spinnerbaits have long been a staple of the Bass Pro Shop's mash catalog, of which I own more than a few. Well, I scoured my collection of vintage catalogs and came up with what I thought was the quintessential year outlining spinnerbaits. We'll call it the year of the spinnerbait. I actually landed on the year that got me started in bass fishing, the 1991 Master Catalog, which has over 10 pages dedicated to the spinnerbait. So now let's take a look at the latest spinnerbait offerings from 33 years ago. All right, so here is the 1991 Bass Pro Shops Master Catalog. Uh, this is one of my all-time favorites. And what I loved about the catalog back in those days is how prominent spinnerbaits were. We'll go ahead and flip to the start of not just the spinnerbait section, but the start of the actual lure section. Tackle box is here. Boom. The first lures talked about at all are, in fact, spinnerbaits. Bass Pro Shops was uh, really well known for leading off with their pretty extensive line of spinnerbaits. And on the left, we see one of my discontinued favorites, the Shoestring Dubois Tornado Spinnerbait. Man, this thing went for $5.95 back in the day. And I've talked about this one a few times on this channel. Yeah, you can't get them for that much anymore. These things go for upwards of 30 bucks unboxed. And honestly, even in the package, I've seen them as high as 40 or 50 bucks. But a great spinnerbait that I would love to see Bass Pro Shops reissue if they ever reissue any. 
Opposite that, we've got the Laser Eye Spinnerbait. I like this one. It's got actually some really cool painted blades as well as that actual laser eye finish, which I loved. Those were available in a couple of different configurations, ranging from $1.99 on up to $2.29. They, of course, always had the discount versions of spinner baits, just like any other baits at Bass Pro. And they've got the Uncle Bucks spinner baits for a buck twenty-nine. Man, that is a pretty good deal for a pretty solid fish catcher from 1991. Always like this old hams uh, trailer screw lock. That's actually a really cool way to add a trailer to a spinnerbait. And I think you probably could do that uh, these days if you wanted to. I just don't see a lot of folks putting trailers on spinnerbaits anymore. All right, flipping over, uh, we do have some more Bass Pro branded baits. Not just spinnerbaits, but a couple of them off of their Cajun Rattler technology. I actually have a few of these. This is a pretty cool, it is a blade, but it's got a little sound chamber in there with a metal BB. It is certainly a pretty noisy spinnerbait, not quite as noisy as like a man's loudmouth spinnerbait, but it's a pretty cool design. It's got a really nice laser eye. Um, honestly, more of sort of a rattlesnake eye look to it. Really, really cool bait, and probably actually one that I actually like even more than the Tornado. Opposite that, we've got uh, Mr. Lonnie Stanley. Ah, oh, man. A lot of people talk about Stanley jigs, but to me, my favorite was always the Stanley spinner baits. Now, this is pre-Stanley uh, wedge era. We've got the Viber Shaft and also this one, the Thumper. What I loved about Stanley Bates, not just the blades, I love the skirts. They came out with some really cool colors, really based off of their jig selection. Um, but just check out that blue, white, and chartreuse. That is a pretty awesome looking bait. If you wanted to add a trailer to the Stanleys, they've also got this, the Stanley Pro Trailer, featuring some add-on rattlers. All right, moving on, a classic spinnerbait company from a classic spinnerbait salesman, Mr. Bill Dance. Striking had a pretty epic line of spinnerbaits in 1991. Starting out with these, just the All Pro 38 Special, as well as their standard spinnerbaits, ranging from, what, $2.29 on up to $2.49. So definitely a few bucks cheaper than a spinnerbait of today. Down here, we've got one of my favorites, the Pro Model Spinnerbait with a giant blade. It actually comes with two of them, uh, as well as a really nice uh, sort of weed guard that goes on top of the swivel. This one's available for $2.59. And last on this page, a pretty cool one, the Short Arm Spinnerbait. I actually don't think I have one of these. The Short Arm was designed by Bill Dance. It's got the Y weed guard to help you get through the heavy uh, brush or when ripping the weed beds. Nice. All right, we've got some other striking stuff here, but I do think the spinnerbaits continue on the next page, and they do. All right, up here from Worm King and the late great Guido Hibden. This is a pretty cool Guido's trailer hitch spinnerbait. I actually don't know that I have one of these, but what I love about this spinnerbait, in particular this color, is that is 05, and let's see what that's called, chartreuse copper. Doesn't it almost look like a worm color design? It really looks like some sort of, a, I don't know, a green pumpkin or a, a brown pumpkin bait that you would see in a, in a worm. I love that. Below that, we've got some big bass spinner baits uh, endorsed and probably designed by Mr. Roland Martin from Blue Fox. Uh, those are available on up to $2.89. So uh, definitely kind of pushing the envelope on the, the price of those, huh? Wow. <laughs> Over here, we've got some MEPS Bass Killer Spinnerbaits. I actually have a number of these. What's so interesting about MEPS is much more known for their inline spinners. They did have a brief, probably not too successful foray into traditional bass spinnerbaits. But one of my favorites was this, the Bass Killer. I love the living rubber skirt as well as the classic MEPS blades. Moving on to the other side, we've got a couple of more, um, I would say, lesser known spinnerbaits, discontinued for sure. Here's one from Bulldog Lures, the Hog Dog. Uh, it is an explosion of flash in the water, the bait the pros are asking for, for $3.59 for three different sizes. 
Uh, down here, we've got one from a Charlie Campbell, the Chatterblade Spinnerbait. Looks like there's a sort of an interesting blade there with a little bit of a notch cut out of it. I've actually never seen one of those in person, so I can't really speak to that one. But I have fished this one, the Shaker. I think it's also called the Heart Shaker. It has got three very unique Shaker blades. This is one that I'm pretty sure I saw Ken Cook fishing a time or two. I've actually got a few of these, and this one definitely has a very different profile in the water. Well, I think last but not least on the spinnerbait page is uh, Mans and Hank Parker have teamed up with two baits that are guaranteed to land incredible results. Of course, the classic spinnerbait is what we're here for. Man, one of the most iconic spinnerbaits of all time. Of course, a bait that landed him a Bassmaster Classic victory. And a bait that Hank Parker actually re-released and is selling through his own website today. So that is it for the spinnerbait section. We get into some other stuff, some buzz baits and so on. But a pretty epic spread on a pretty epic bait in 1991. I recently reached out to professional bass fisherman and antique tackle collector Bernie Schultz to get his perspective on spinnerbait bass fishing. And I asked him if he would share one or two top secret tips for you guys on how he catches fish with the spinnerbait. Bernie passed along two tips that I'm pretty excited to share with you. The first is that when he is fishing a shallow weedy flat, Bernie puts the wind to his back and casts directly downwind, retrieving the spinnerbait just under the surface. This way he's actually drifting over top of grass beds that have not yet been spooked by the trolling motor. So a great tip that I definitely am going to employ next time I'm on one of those style lakes. Now when dealing with a similar situation and a stiff breeze, Bernie actually relies on his power pole drift paddles and drags them just enough to control drift speed. Bernie says this is a killer technique in his home state of Florida or anywhere else that the water is reasonably clear but with thick grass. For these two techniques, Bernie will specifically use Hildebrandt brand spinnerbaits and two of his favorites made specifically for dingy water. One is called the blade and the other is the tin roller. From the twin spin to the hell diver, the beetle spin to the H&H &H spinner, the Okie bug to the man's classic. <sighs> spinnerbaits remain to this day one of my favorite baits to fish. Hopefully you enjoyed this little walkthrough of one of my favorite baits, the spinnerbait. And I would definitely like to hear from you guys on which bait you would like to see featured next in our history of episode. If you're looking for some more old school content, well, you can click right here. Otherwise, I'll see you right back here, same time, same place. And until then, keep that carpet side up, keep that blade a spinning, and definitely fish it old school. Fishing it old school, this old stuff rules. Welcome to Retro Bastards.